<clears throat> so this is probably how you remember stress, right, from 319. Stress is a force per unit area. But consider this. Consider, you know, so when I say per unit area, I've determined the area. Right? The area is with respect to a plane that I've identified like this that slices through the middle, right? So we normally, that's the arrow area we normalize by. The area we normalize by is a you know, in this sort of one-dimensional example of stress, the area we normalize by is the area of a plane that's defined by a, a unit vector that's perpendicular and, or parallel with the force you're applying. So in this case, it would be a unit vector pointing up there, and that would define. You, normally, when you define planes, you, you can define them by a unit vector normal to them. Right? So let's consider this, then. Let's, let's take our same exact kind of tension bar and except this time, and we're going to apply the same force to it, but this time I'm going to take a different plane that I'm going to slice through. We'll call this area here A prime. So then we could define a stress, uh, sigma prime, that's the same force divided by A prime. Okay. Now the force is the same. My definition, I mean, I, I, I said that when I wrote down my thought experiment. F is equal to F. Well, is, and, and then all I'm saying, the only other thing I'm saying is that A prime is not A. So then, is the stress equal to, you know, is sigma equal to sigma prime? Can't be, right? Can't be, because I have the same force divided by a different area. Therefore, there seems to be some kind of paradox here. Right? Our, our definition of stress seems to be not, not consistent or something. Right? And so, the, the, the outcome or the, 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 the paradox is that it's, it's solved by the fact that stress is coordinate frame dependent. Right? It's coordinate frame dependent. And so in this case, we can imagine that in the original example, I have a coordinate frame here, right, that I superimposed on this plane. Right? But now in this example, I have a different coordinate system have a different coordinate system that's superimposed on this plane. And if I were to understand how the, you know, how this coordinate system transforms into that one, then I could actually use the stress, you know, to, to transform between sigma and sigma prime. And you'd see that they're, you know, they, they're, they're a measure of the same quantity. Right? But ultimately it owes to the fact that stress is a tensor, and we'll see where that comes from. Uh, and um, so when I, when I change the coordinate system in which I'm dividing by, I kind of make this no longer a one-dimensional problem. And so stress is something more than this very simple definition that we learned in, in mechanics. <clears throat> so we do that. Let's consider a large chunk of the Earth's crust, just to give it some context and what stresses we're interested in, right? And as we've discussed, any significant chunk of the Earth's crust has some external forces being applied to it due to <clears throat> uh, due to tectonic motion, right? We've already discussed that. 
And I've drawn, I've drawn the forces here in compression, but it doesn't really matter how you draw them as long as you're consistent with your sign dimension. And I drew them in compression because most of the Earth's crust is in compression. Um, it's, it, it can happen, but it's rare that it's intentional. So what I want to do then, is I'm going to take a little infinitesimally small block of the Earth's crust. And I'm infinitesimally small is important here. I'm going to take an infinitesimally small block of the Earth's crust, and I'm going to pull it out, and I'm going to plop it onto a coordinate system that I, I lay down. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to cut it out, and plop it on a coordinate system that I'll call uh, x1, x2, x3. So this is my little infinitesimally small block on the coordinate system. Another way to say this is that I'm actually going to decide on a coordinate system here, and then now we're just taking a closer look at it. We're zooming in on it. So another way, or probably a more accurate statement is I'm, I'm going to put a coordinate system on an infinitesimally small block in the Earth's crust, and then we're just going to zoom in on it and look at it. Okay. Now, because there's external forces due to tectonic motion here, and this thing is in equilibrium, right? roughly in equilibrium, in the sense that you know no large chunk of the Earth, of the Earth's crust is flying through the, through the air. Right? It's sort of it, we know it moves, but it moves very slowly. So we're going to consider it to be in equilibrium. Then, because it's in equilibrium, then this, those forces can be superimposed on our little cube, right? Because if I'm pushing out here on this large section of the Earth's crust, that fo force is going to be continuously transmitted onto our little surface there. And so what I'm going to do is, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw tractions. Traction is, a, is like a stress vector, so the force per unit area, where you know, the, the unit area is the area of my little cube here. So I have this stress vector, traction is another word for stress vector, T. And I've drawn it on this face, but to help myself identify, because ultimately all of these faces are going to have, I mean, there's, there's stresses everywhere here in all directions. So ultimately all of these faces are going to have stress vectors associated with them. And so in order to sort of just label it, I'm going to identify this stress vector with a unit vector that's normal to this plane. Right? This plane is normal to the x2 direction. So I'm going to I'm going to call I'm going to draw a unit vector right here that we'll call E2. It's just a little unit vector that's parallel to x2, but of unit length, of course. And then to help identify our stress vector that's associated, that emanates from the E2 face, I'm just going to, in, in, uh, in the parentheses there, write E2. And so uh, likewise, I'll draw a unit vector from the E3 face. I'll draw one from the E1 phase. And all of these faces, again, have traction vectors associated with them that we'll identify by the face in which they emanate from. Right. Now, now my plot's going to get, or my little picture is going to get a little busy, because again, my little, you know, if this thing is in equilibrium, it's not flying around through. You know, my large piece of Earth is not flying around unattached to anything. It's in equilibrium. Then my little cube is also in equilibrium, which means that all these forces I've drawn 
have equal and opposite forces on the other side of it. And so, uh, you know, basically, there's a force that's equal and opposite in the negative uh, E2 direction. And there's another force equal and opposite. negative E3, uh, sorry, this, this one is E2, this one is E3, and then there's another one, something like that, that's E1, right? So, the last thing I'm going to do with my little cube, right, now that we've drawn all those labels on there, is I'm going to cut I'm going to cut this on a plane at an angle like this. I'm going to cut that on a plane at an angle like that through the center of the cube so that I leave behind a tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. So all I'm doing right now is this. We, we know that we have a piece of crust, and inside that crust, of the, and it's, there's tectonic forces on it, and it's in equilibrium. So we're just pulling out a little infinitesimal piece, and we're labeling all those forces on the sides. Right? We're not doing anything, anything else. We're just assigning labels to all those forces. Okay? And then we're going to slice our little cube in, ha in, a, in a tetrahedron, and when we do that, we, we end up with this. And this is called the Kochi tetrahedron. So if you notice, all the labels are the same. Right? So now we're just look, we have the blue vectors, which are the labels on the back side of our little cube, right? And we've cut it through the plane here, and the, and the only thing we've added is that we've saying, okay, there's a normal vector to this plane, and therefore, there's a track because the thing's in equilibrium. There's a traction that we're going to identify with the normal. Okay, so again, it's a little, it seems a little complicated, but we're just drawing labels. That's it. Right. Now, whenever you set out to work in mechanics, yeah? Um, so, T, the E's are. The E's are, are normal vectors to, that define the, the planes, essentially. Right? Usually when we define, a, in geometry, we, when you talk about a plane, you, you can define it mathematically with respect to its normal vector. Right? So what we're really trying to do is define this plane with respect to a normal vector. And we just, then we just call them E1, E2, E3. You could call them IJ. You're probably more used to IJK. Right? Think, you know, IJKs. From physics or from uh, from statics or, or uh, mechanics, they're just unit vectors in, in three orthogonal directions. That's all we have here: unit vectors in three orthogonal directions. Okay, and then the tractions are actual forces, right, or forces per unit area that are applied to those infinitesimally small faces. They come from the tectonic forces. Okay, so they're just our labels. Now, we don't know what direction. Obviously, is the way I have it drawn, that traction vector TE2 is not collinear, necessarily, in general, collinear with E2. Right. So, the it, it, it's being applied on the E2 face, but not necessarily in the E2 direction. Right. right? It's got its own three components. It's a vector. Right? So, I drew the little arrow over the top of it. So the, the E's just identify the face in which the vector emanates from. Each of those vectors have their own components. Okay. Okay. So then after we slice it and redraw it nicely, this is what we have left. Okay. Um, one last thing here, or kind of two more. 
points. Here we now have a unit vector n, okay, and it has three components, n1, n2, n3. And I don't, I don't know exactly what those components are, but I know that I know that they're formed by the cosine of the angle between n1 and x1 and n2 and x2 and n3 and x3. So again, I don't <coughs> I don't know what the I don't know what this evaluates to. Right? I don't know what the number is, but I know that it's the cosine Th th those components are the cosine between uh, n and the x3. I shouldn't have the component. I shouldn't have the. Uh, so again, the components of the unit vector are the cosine of the unit vector with the x1 axis, the cosine of the unit vector with the x2 axis, and the cosine of the unit vector with the x3 axis. Okay? So that's one thing to sort of hold in our pocket. Another thing is that if I have a if I have a line, the line say is, is the length L, and I have some um, I want to know what the projection, I want to know what the projection of that line onto this plane is. What is it? It's L cosine theta, right? So, again, this is just geometry. So this, this distance here is the projection. That's L cosine theta. Well, this, so you all know this for a line, okay? What you may not know is that this rule extends two areas. So if I were to say then take this picture, extend it out like this, and I'm now asking not what is the projection of the line onto a line, but rather what is the projection of this plane that's in a, at an angle theta? What's the projection of the area of this plane it's at an angle theta with this plane, you know, down onto the plane. And if this area, if I give it a label, if I give it a label, uh, say A, if I give this plane a label A, then the same sort of rule applies that, um, you know, A prime, if you will, is A cosine theta. So where A prime would be you know, this projection, projected area down onto the other plane. So that's A prime. Everybody sort of understand my picture? Like, just take the rule for a line, extend it into two dimensions, and the same rule applies. The area here projected down below onto the plane is transformed by the cosine of the angle between. Okay. So then, again, whenever you set out to solve a mechanics problem and you don't know what else to do, this is like the golden rule of mechanics. If you don't know what else to do, where should you start? Newton's second law, right? F equals MA. So if you don't know where else to start, let's just write down F equals MA. And then usually in mechanics or statics, you wrote down a free body diagram, right? Well, that's what this is. This is our free body diagram. 
It's just our body is an infinitesimally small tetrahedron. So let's write down F equals MA. Well, if we want to sum the forces in this direction, we have this vector, right, F, but that's a traction vector. It's a force per unit area. So we want to, to write down F equals MA, we need to write down a force. Right? So it's then, it's just the, that times the area, and the area is dA, right? we, by label, but just by decision. Right? This area of the tetrahedron is dA, so we're going to write down Tn times dA. That's going to give us, so we'll write down, you know, this, is, this is nothing more than F equals MA. So we're going to have T identified by N times dA. Okay, that's, a, that's in the positive direction. So these are, everything on this side is in positive. Everything on that side is negative. So now let's, let's write down the other tractions that act on the other faces, okay? So the first one is in the negative, uh, we have negative T in the E1 times the area of this back face, okay? And sort of combining these rules, right? We know the area of the front face, and we can then use this um, definite, we know that the unit vector N1 is the cosine of the unit vector n with the x1 axis. And we can basically then say that this dA1 back here, dA1 back there, turns out is just, so we have negative t in the E1 times dA1, but dA1 is equal to, is equal to N times DA. N1, N1 times DA. <clears throat> then we'll write down the rest of them. So we have minus T in the E2 times N2 DA minus T in the E3 times N3 DA. Right, so that's the left hand side, that's the forces. Okay, that's the forces, and that's all equal to ma, right? Well, what's what's the, we don't know what, mass is, is density times volume, right? So we don't know what the density is exactly, so we're just going to write rho. But we do know that the volume of a tetrahedron is one-third, it's based, a tetrahedron is like a pyramid, right? In this case, because they're all equal, it's a equal sides. So the volume of a pyramid is the base one third the base times the height. Right. So in this case, one third the base is dA. The height is h. So that's mass times acceleration. Acceleration we'll just call a. Right. Well, the first thing you notice is that there's a dA everywhere. So there's a DA in every term, so we can cancel it. So we'll cancel all the DAs. Okay. And the next thing is that this is an infinitesimally small cube, right, a tetrahedron. So in reality, our H is some quantity that tends towards zero. So what we want to do is take the limit of this F equals MA expression, take the limit as H goes to zero. And so if you do that, then this whole term goes to zero. So this whole term goes to zero. And then what you're left with is T n equal to T in the E1 n1 plus T in the E N2 plus T in the N3, N3. So I'm going to switch to a blank sheet now, but this is our equation. Now remember, 
these are vectors, right? This is a vector. So that's, you know, that's a vector with three components. That's a vector with three components. That's a vector with three components. So if we rewrite this expression then, if we write out all the components, we have, you know, T1, T2, T3 associated with N is equal to T1, T2, T3 associated with E1 times N1 plus T1, T2, T3 associated with E2 plus N2. T1, T2, T3, associated with E3, N3. Right. And so then let's just write, rewrite this in, in, a, in a matrix way. We have T1, N, And this is what we'll identify as the stress. Right? So this equation then is actually T times the stress times N. So this is a vector. That's a unit vector. And the stress is a tensor or a 3 by 3 matrix in this case. Now. There's one last thing, and uh, that is, we want to use we want to use a common notation like we're used to for matrices, right? So, like, I want to write sigma one one. I, I don't want to. This is too bulky to carry around this superscript and subscript, right? So I don't want to. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to use a more ca compact notation, and since we're gonna look at these things like matrices, we want to use sort of matrix-like notation, right? So normally, the components of a matrix look like this. Where the first, the first indice identifies the row and the second is the column. And so we have to make a decision about, you know, with respect to over here, which one of these becomes the row and which one becomes the column. Right? And the decision that is common in mechanics is that the first indice, you know, in, in, in other words, to translate the lingo of matrix components into the way we identify these components on the on the uh, tetrahedron, because remember. These superscripts correspond to the face of the tetrahedron that that vector emanated from. And the subscripts are the components of that vector. Okay? And so th the convention that's been decided upon is that the first indice here is the face, and the second indice is the component of the vector. And so in order to actually make these two things consistent, this is, in fact, the transpose, and that's just because of the convention we used. Right? So this is actually the transpose. Now, later we'll see, well, 
In this class, all we ever use is the Cauchy stress. And the Cauchy stress has the property that it's, transpo it's equal to its transpose. It's symmetric. Right? And so if you want to be lazy, you can leave off that transpose symbol. But if you ever take a graduate class in continuum mechanics, particularly for me, there's other, there's other stress tensors that we can use that won't have that symmetric property. And therefore, that transpose turns out to be important. And so, in other words, you know, so then just finally, uh, again, the components of the stress related back to our traction vectors. So again, if you want to see exactly how, the, these, how, how this definition, this component of stress, relates back to the way we define the traction vectors, if you remember, right, now we're saying the first indice is the face, 3, that corresponded to the E3 face, right, and the second is the component of the vector. Right? So again, one last, I'll write some labels here, uh, the first component is the face, and the second component is the is the vector component. And so there's the stress tensor, and there's its visual definition. So Again, on every face now, you have these three components of the stress, right? So this is the two face identified by E2. So the first component in all of those is two. And the, the second is the component, the direction. So that's important to remember.